tomorrow with uh, Cherry on speech at the Jackson Hole Economic Symposium, and that could produce a little bit of volatility for us before we close out this week. Um, and that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to look at a game plan going into Jackson Hole and how we might be able to adjust given some possible scenarios that might be out there. Um, yeah, and sure, if hit the high point here, you know, things in markets, uh, I say things, uh, volatility in markets is rather quiet right now. Um, you know, largely driven by summer months, the fact that we're in somewhat of a, a drought of data. Um, you know, we had some excitement at the early part of this month. We had some excitement with BOJ, FOMC at the end of July. Since then, it's been pretty slow going. Now, we have Jackson Hole coming up at the end of this weekend, and then September is where things start to get really interesting again. Um, we have Fed and BOJ, September 2021. 20, this one's pretty cool from the fact that the BOJ actually reports or, or issues their statement ahead of the Federal Reserve. Uh, so a little little different than what we had in July where they, they had to report after. And on top of that, there's you know a couple of other, say, extraneous factors that are out there, political movements, if you will, that uh, appear to be seeping into economics in various locales. So we're going to look at a litany of different scenarios that we might be able to look at going into tomorrow. I'm going to go through a couple of quick risk disclaimers first. As usual, any questions that you have, feel free to type those in the chat box. I will do my absolute best to answer them as fully as possible in the Q&A portion of the webinar, which should be in about 35 to 40 minutes. And I'll do my absolute best to answer as many of those questions as I can or right here on the live feed. So thank you for your time in advance. Let's go through those risk disclaimers and let's get right to the chart. Risk disclaimer part one, uh, trading is risky. If you're not familiar with this, Take a few seconds to familiarize yourself with it. We will move on in about 12 seconds from here. All right, 12 seconds by my watch. And the second disclaimer, hypothetical trading disclaimer. We're going to look at some past trades. We're going to look at some strategy. You have to know past performance is not indicative of future results. Give this just about another five seconds and then we'll move on. All right. So uh, getting right to the heart of the matter, U.S. dollar. The U.S. dollar is essentially trading in the middle of this week's range. I know, real exciting. Real exciting stuff, but this is somewhat of, uh, uh, somewhat of dealing with summer months trading. Let's go to that daily. There we go. So uh, you can see here, we gapped up over the weekend. That gap was very much driven by Fed commentary, alluding to the possibility of hawkishness. Um, this was Mr. Stanley Fisher, Vice Chairman of the Federal Reserve, a very, very good uh, indicator to watch. He's very close with Ms. Yellen. And he came out over the weekend, uh, provided some comments in the, uh, the initial intro to Jackson Hole, saying that he felt that economic data was pretty close to the Fed's targets. USD gaps up. And you can see it sold off right after that, moved right down to test those prior lows that we had on Friday. Right there. We got higher low support, now we're just kind of trading in the middle of no man's land, right in the middle of this range that it developed throughout the week. Pretty good indication of a market that's indecisive. It doesn't really have much of a pull one direction or the other. Um, now, as we've been talking about over the past now three weeks, it's appeared as though the Federal Reserve has made a concerted push to transmit hawkishness into markets. We've now seen, I believe the running count is five different Federal Reserve officials coming out with hawkish commentary over the last week and a half. Kicked off with Mr. Dudley last week, followed up by Mr. Lockhart. Uh, we've also heard from Ms. George uh, just yesterday. Uh, we've had John Williams in there, the president of the San Francisco Fed. And then, of course, Mr. Stanley Fisher, is, uh, as I just mentioned a moment ago. So each of these Federal Reserve officials have come out with somewhat of, of hawkish commentary for markets. And you can see the US dollar, rather market participants as voicing it in the US dollar simply are not buying that right now. Now that makes sense as to why. And if we look back at recent historical pricing patterns in the US dollar, it, it makes sense given the way that we've seen price action coming in. For example, what we have right now is very similar to what we had in May, where when expectations for rate hikes out of the United States were extremely low, the Fed spent much of the month talking up the prospect of a rate hike in June. And you can see, markets bought it a little bit, right? It took a little while for this to happen. Uh, April FOMC was right here. Notice the U.S. dollar sold off in the wake of that announcement. But it was, it was actually the RBA's interest rate cut. Kind of took everybody by surprise here on May 3rd that helped set that bottom in the U.S. dollar. 
And as the Fed talks with the prospect of higher rates, USD moves along with it throughout the month of May. It wasn't until we got right here. That was the June 3rd NFP gauge for the month of May. That was a pretty big miss. But you can see here where we essentially erased like three weeks worth of gains in the US dollar in one day on a pretty bad data print. We could fast forward to current current space. Here's the Briggs referendum that pops the US dollar higher. USD holds support on the idea that the Fed may go a little more hawkish in July. This is that July rate meeting, rate decision. They did go a little bit more hawkish. Notice the USD is just hanging out of support because it, 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 it seems as though markets were still fading the idea of the Fed actually hiking rates. And then two days later, we got a really bad GDP report, much like we saw back here. We see the US dollar just dumping lower as traders are saying, okay, yeah, I get that the Fed's saying they're going to hike, but given recent history of them saying they're going to hike and then not hiking, well, now that we have bad data, they have an excuse not to hike. And so you can see where that U.S. dollar just spurned into another extension on the downtrend. It's continued moving lower. Set a new lower low last week. And right now we're trading in the middle of no man's land of that fresh lower low. So what's going to happen tomorrow? Well, tomorrow we get a speech from the chair of the Federal Reserve. So she's like the one you do want to listen to above even Stanley Fisher or William Dudley or even Mr. John Williams. Now, at this speech, she's not even necessarily, we don't, I mean, we don't even really know what she's going to say. The thought is that she might use that as an opportunity to, to further the themes that have been initiated by her Federal Reserve colleagues, i.e., perhaps making commentary that could allude to the potential for rate hikes. Maybe at the September meeting, but by the end of 2016. If she does give commentary that alludes to the fact that the Federal Reserve is nearing a hike, then I'm expecting that we are going to see U.S. dollar strength as these market expectations for continued dovish Fed get priced out of the market. Now, if she goes dovish, I do think we're going to see the U.S. dollar sell off. I just don't know how deeply that, 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 that downside run might continue because we have these longer-term support structures that have been building here. There's the May 3rd low, the June low. There's a higher low in there. And, and it could be a little more challenging to imagine that scenario co continuing to take place. Because you got to think the Fed's trying to look at what the next problem is going to be, right? Now we have oil prices going back up. It's a potential issue as far as future inflationary concerns. As in, if oil prices move up to $80 a barrel next year and we still have zero rates and we still have the Federal Reserve talking monetary policy lower and lower and lower and lower, then we could end up with a differential of a real rate of return, like negative 4%. If inflation ticks up to 4% as driven by higher oil prices and rates are still zero, that creates a conundrum. So the Fed might be trying to look around the corner to see what the next issue is going to be in the effort of preempting that. Now, the reason that I bring this up is because while market expectations appear to be extremely dovish, expecting the Fed state to stay loose and passive, the Fed could have easily backed off of this whole rate hike drama last year. If we go back to just a year ago, August 24th last year, that's when China's Black Monday was beginning to permeate throughout the rest of the world. Notice here in the S&P 500, it was a brutal couple of days. There's that August 24th move. There we go. That's the big one. Right there. And so it was just about a year ago that this began to pipe in, right? Well, what helped to bring strength back was the Fed saying, oh, we don't have to hike in September. Then in September they said, well, yeah, we might hike in December, and the stocks go right back down. And then Mr. Dudley again, we don't have to hike in December. Stocks go back up. They actually make the hike, then stocks go down. They say, oh, we don't have to hike. Stocks back up. That month of May, when the Fed was talking to higher rates, notice how this S&P channeled lower for a decent portion of that time. So, short story, go in expecting the unexpected. My personal bias is to look for hawkishness because it appears as though what we have seen, early indications on some of these Fed chiefs, uh, it, it appears as though they're trying to further this theme of, of, of persistently trying to talk up the prospect of normalization. So if I did have to pick a side, I'm going to be looking for USD strength. Now, on the effort of USD strength, one of the setups that I like the most right now is in the dollar-yen. 
though admittedly the technical formation on here not bullish at all um, ever since it was it was right around China's Black Monday last year notice 824 that's when we got this huge spike lower on the dollar yen ever since that move the dollar yen has been in a rather bearish state and we've seen a ton of yen strength coming here this thing is priced off about 18 percent moving from around 120 down to 100 flat now this is a major psychological level uh, 100 flat given quite a few price action inflections in the past you know when we get these big psychological levels they'll often have a tendency to elicit you know, a, a, a modification in trading sentiment right like if you're a, a, a Japanese resident or maybe even just say a Japanese exporter when the spot price in dollar yen goes below 100 you take notice so even though it's 100.01 Versus 99.99 is only two pips of difference. It's a noticeable two pips, right? So these longer term round levels will often have a tendency to provide some element of support and resistance. And I think that's what we've seen here in the dollar yen over the last, say, month and a half. Uh, so there's the Brexit scenario. Things get really wild, really quick, strong risk aversion. Now the July swing low came in right at that 100 flat level. And then after that, we saw the prospect of yen stimulus or an increase in yen stimulus, Japanese stimulus, excuse me, bringing in weakness to the yen. We've got a little higher high in here. Now, when the BOJ didn't come to the table with that, well, with what markets were expecting in their July meeting, you can see where that got priced out really quickly. There's the BOJ meeting for July right there. Notice this thing breaks lower, and we get right back down, even below that July low. And I've been long in this thing for a little over a week now. I had uh, stop. My stop is at like 99.42. I came like 10 pips from getting stopped out on the spike lower. Since then, it's been building higher low support, higher low support. So I'm still in the position. Still like the position, uh, even though it's not uh, hasn't hasn't worked out great for me yet. But this is one of the long USD theorems I'm looking at going into tomorrow because I'm not necessarily just playing this on the prospect of long USD. It's on the potential policy divergence that we might see should the Fed start going hawkish again right because the one thing that we know is that the BOJ is probably not close to rate hikes anytime soon if we do get that shift where markets begin to price in a heavier expectation of a rate hike out of the Fed well at the very least that gives me a cleaner driver on one side of this pair and then if we get follow-up from the BOJ at some point with that bazooka that many are expecting, then we can see a continuation of that move. So uh, uh, kind of front-loading this one on the prospect of USD strength with, with the back-end prospect of yen weakness coming about, should that divergence take place. Uh, Reef with a good question here. How much more can the BOJ do? They can do a lot more. It's a central bank. They can print money. They can they literally set the rules and the paradigm for the game. Um, I think it's a good indication, you, you could refer back to the ECB a policy, I believe it was in March, when they launched that huge corporate bond buying program. And of course, there were a lot of questions about that, right? Because, I mean, the idea of a central bank using taxpayer dollars to buy corporate bonds, I mean, if you go back 40 years ago and, and propose that to Congress, you'd get laughed out of the room. Now it's commonplace. Uh, we're seeing that out of the UK, we're seeing that out of the ECB, and it may be coming to an economy near you very soon. Um, but as we saw that, the ECB had a very interesting footnote that said technically a central bank can't go broke because they create money. And they can create money indefinitely. So you can't quite break a central bank. Now, as far as what they're doing now, one of the big consternations, I believe the reason you're asking that question is because it, after three years, almost four years now, of heavy and aggressive quantitative easing, the BOJ has essentially cornered their own Japanese government bond market. The last I looked, they own 38.1% of Japanese government bonds, which is which is a big amount. <laughs> um, it's getting to the point now, and and you know, so taking a step back, these Japanese government bonds have an actual usage in the Japanese economy. It's not just like oh, a bond that some you know retiree wants to buy and clip coupons. No. Banks use these bonds as collateral with other banks in interbank market transactions, right? It's, it's an important collateralization tool. So if, let's say, Bank A is going to sell half of their JGB holdings to the BOJ, well, now that gives them less firepower 
for their actual operations because now they have less in JGBs that they could use for collateralization purposes. So it does create an issue, but I also think that the BOJ is open to taking on risks. I mean, heck, we can go back like two years now and say the same type of thing, right? Uh, they were, they were, they were, you know, increasing that market share within JGBs, and and you know, the writing on the wall wasn't very attractive. Japan needed more QE. Everybody knew it, and and they were running out of assets to do it with. So what did they do? Right here, October thirty first, twenty fourteen, they started buying stocks with QE. Again, another another one of these highly experimental policies that at the time was 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 largely criticized. All right, if you go back forty years ago and say, well, hey, taxpayer dollars are going to be used to buy stocks to be held at the central bank, in this case it's actually the government pension investment fund, but driven by the central bank, you probably would have been laughed out of the room. But again, today it's becoming more commonplace as these central banks look for new and more experimental ways of um, of trying to manage their economies. So, you know, they had their back against the wall here, they came up with something new. And that even extended the whole Abenomics trade for, for a bit. Uh, January 31st of this year, same kind of thing, right? We know Japan needs more. they are in a dire situation. They, they shocked everybody by moving to negative rates back in January. And it gave us like one day's worth of yen weakness, and then, it, and then the strength came right back. <laughs> right. So I mean, these are well. This in particular, in my uh, opinion, is a really good example, uh, illustration, if you will, of the BOJ being at the point. I, I don't want to use the word desperation, but at the point of let's call it discouragement. With, with past policies and their impact, that they're willing to do more, be more aggressive, and, and maybe take on a little bit more risk in some of these experimental policies. So what I'm kind of referring to here is helicopter money. I don't know if they're going to do it. Personally, I don't think it's a good idea. But I don't think negative rates are a good idea anyways, and the BOJ doesn't care what I think. So I, I, I think this is something that will be on the table as we get a little bit closer to September. Because you know the decision set for the BOJ is the same as it was in Q3 of 2012 before Shinzo Abe came to power. Their options are do nothing or more QE. And we know what do nothing brings. So rationally speaking, in that situation, most people, most rational people will make the decision to at least fight rather than just give up and die. I'm not saying the Japanese economy is going to die, but if the yen strength is down to 75, that's going to create considerable pressure on Japanese exporters, and that's going to reverberate throughout an economy that already has a demographic issue to deal with. So I do think they're going to do what they can. The big question is whether it's at September or whether it comes in December. Now, if you're the BOJ and you're backed into a corner and you have one bullet left, I guess the, the question is whether or not you think they have one bullet left or not. If they have only like one I'm using the term bullet loosely, of course. One more big action that they could splash. It makes sense to wait. But if you think they have more, if you think they could come up with more ideas, well, then September's looking pretty optimal. Uh, but keep it as simple. Going back to Jackson Hole, I do think if, if we do see some USD strength on the back of a hawkish yell and commentary, I do think the dollar yen is going to benefit off of that pretty nicely. Um, now, another market that I'm looking for some benefits should the dollar strengthen, but I'm also open to trading it in the event of dollar weakness is right here in gold. Um, the big question that I've had over the past couple of days is we've seen gold break through the support. And it built into a fairly decent symmetrical wedge formation here. Uh, but as gold tipped over and then broke through yesterday, the question that I had was whether or not we had markets pre trying to preempt that yell and hawkishness, right? Um, this has maybe been one of the more interesting anti-Fed or anti-dollar plays this year. I'll give you a quick context. This thing's basically been in a downtrend since 2011. And this is as markets were, were, were kind of coming to grips with the eventual end of QE, the eventual prospect of normalization, and, and well, the, the, uh, the, the incorrect assumption that eventually inflation would return. Inflation, not a good thing to gold, right? because you can't inflate gold. So if the US dollar is getting stronger on the back of inflation and higher rates, well, then gold is just eating it, right? We talked about back here in 2011 at the height of the QE craze, about 1920. Notice we've gotten into this downtrending type of formation by 2013. 
Then we put in this really consistent two-year two year plus trend channel. Again, this was markets expecting that eventually inflation would return, eventually the Fed would normalize rates. This this you know longer term forward guidance plan to start hiking rates in, in 2015. I mean it it was it was you know it was very much driving dollar strength for a couple of years before we ever got to 2015. Now when we got to 2015, the Fed backed off multiple times from hiking rates. But it was when they capitulated or appeared to capitulate early portion of this year when gold really began to catch a major bid as markets began to say or apparently say, well, there's no inflation showing. And even though the Fed says they want to hike rates, it probably won't because historical patterns have shown that they don't or that they haven't, even when data has said that they could. So, I mean, it is real interesting price action throughout the year is kind of the counter to that theme. Okay, so as global pressure was heating up, as it was looking less and less likely that inflation was eventually going to come about, gold spikes higher. And that was Miss Yellen's congressional testimony, the capitulation that I mentioned a moment ago. And so notice what had happened there. We had broken through this prior swing high, and this is a strong initiation of a new bullish trend after a five-year plus, four-and-a-half-year-plus bearish trend. Now, the difficult part about trading gold this year is that the trend side moves have been rather fast and violent, right? Kind of like those those uh, those downside moves in the U.S. dollar. And then it kind of chops around for a little bit. You know, one of those fast and violent trend side moves, and then, and then it retraces. So remember what we were talking about the month of May? Fed's talking up the idea of higher rates in the month of June. You know, potentially hiking when 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 few were expecting it. Well, this is how gold responded. Gold shed like a hundred dollars throughout the month of May. Uh, you know, as the Fed was driving those rate expectations, or trying to drive those rate expectations a little bit higher. Now, just like I mentioned a little bit earlier, it appears that we have the same type of theme taking place today or over the past week. Fed talking up prospect to higher rates in the next meeting in September. Markets are not responding nearly to the same degree that they did back in May. So this is just another reason that I'm harboring that expectation that we will potentially see Ms. Yellen like a, strike a slightly hawkish tone tomorrow. Now, I don't think she's going to come straight out and say, oh, well, September's on. That wouldn't make sense, right? Going back to what we were speaking about on the BOJ, flexibility, policy options, uh, keeping your powder dry, if you will, it would make sense for her to, to, to be that forthright tomorrow. But she can hint at it in the effort of getting those rate expectations moving in the direction that she wants. Now, should that happen, and if we do get that dollar strength, I would love to see gold prices continue to break lower. I want to see something like we had in the month of May, where gold begins to break through some of these prior swing support levels that many traders are probably using for stops. Gold has been up like 26% this year. We're not the only ones that know that this thing has been on a tear throughout 2016. And if you look at the investment spectrum, the fact that stocks are at all-time highs, bonds are at all-time highs, the U.S. dollar is messy because nobody knows what the Fed's going to do, and all these central banks are seemingly getting more and more desperate, there's not a clear catalyst or driver there. So one logical avenue to go in times of central bank stress is gold. So we're probably not the only ones watching this. And you've got to imagine, when you do have market sentiment getting one-sided in something, like we have in gold getting long right now, each of these stops or each of these uh, swing lows probably has a whole batch of stops underneath it from folks that are trying to do the same type of thing that we're trying to do. Basically buying an uptrend cheaply whilst at support. You know, and uh, folks that check my webinars out, I'm sure you've seen me do this. I'll try to catch an entry here so that I get a stop underneath. Basically look for a way to risk a dollar to try to make two or three. Well, this isn't like unique. <laughs> I'll readily admit that this is a, a very obvious thing to be trying to do, but when we get a counter trend movement, what that also means is that if prices can come and break through this little swing low, there's likely going to be some stops, long position stops, which are orders to sell, which could exacerbate the downside movement and continue pushing us a little bit deeper and a little bit deeper and a little bit deeper. So if this swing at 1310 breaks, I want to try to buy support at this range, this from about 1283.82 up to 1286.14. And 
And I'm not going to be too picky. I just want support to develop somewhere around that range. Now, the way that I'm going to idealize this is I'm going to try to mesh it up with the scenario that we had on 530. On 530, that was after the month of May, saw that, that gold price run $100 lower. We ran right into a longer-term Fibonacci value here, 1,200 flat, 1,200 spot four one to be exact. That longer-term Fib, it's pretty obvious. It's just right here taking the low in 1968 up to the 2011 high. 38.2% of that move comes right in at 1,200. That was the May low. And right down, caught support. And then after that support came in, this thing got aggressive. Now, remember that June 3rd NFP read that came in pretty bad? This is when markets said there's no way the Fed's going to hike, even though they say they want to. Look at the way the gold responded. So I want this thing to break through some of those deeper support levels to clear out some of those, some of those long position holders. In the effort of getting a deeper support entry here in the 1283 to 1286 area, a couple of long-term fibs that I have down here. Now, if I could get that, and if I could confirm support, I might even let price get away from me and look for that higher low. Then I could look to take the long position in the expectation that eventually the Fed will relent. Relent, and let me put an asterisk next to this, relent after they gear those expectations higher as they did throughout the month of May. Now, I don't expect that the Fed actually wants to hike. But I do think that the Fed is getting more and more concerned about what they're creating. And what they're creating, or what I'm referring to here, is the fact that both stock and bond markets are setting very near all-time highs. I'm not going to use the B word. A lot of people like to use the B word. The B word is a dangerous word. Because technically, you don't know that a bubble existed until after it burst. But the fact that we do have highs in both of these markets simultaneously, historically speaking, is an extreme abnormality. I'd be very surprised if the Federal Reserve hadn't at least, at the very least, taken note of this. Now, why is that? Well, the reason that we have highs in both these markets, record highs in both these markets, is the fact that central banks have been driving liquidity through banks to try to promulgate the growth. It's not rocket science here. I think any economist will readily admit that that's what their goal has been, to flush liquidity throughout the financial system via banks so that banks go out and lend more, and then when banks lend more, you have people borrowing, building businesses, et cetera, that the eventual idea that inflation will follow. Well, that hasn't happened. I've been doing this now seven years, and it hasn't happened. So would ration to believe that the Fed has a very vested interest in trying to keep markets at the very least a little bit cautious of their hawkishness to prevent even deeper bubble-like conditions in many of these markets that have been driven by QE. So again, I don't expect that the Fed's going to hike, but I do think that they have a vested interest in trying to keep markets, I don't even want to use the term on their toes, but similar to that, a little bit more honest. Uh, so dollar yen, one of the interests that I have in the effort of, uh, of long USD. Uh, gold, on the other hand, I'd love to see long USD or a strong dollar push this down to a lower, deeper level of 1283 to 1286. Uh, quick caveat here, because I was looking to do the same type of thing in May, wasn't able to catch it. If it doesn't catch support here, I'm not going to chase it. Okay. If it doesn't catch support here, I'm going to let this thing drive. If it has to come down to 1250, if it has to come down to 1240, if it has to come down to 1200, I don't care. The important thing is let support build, let prices begin moving up to confirm that support may actually hold, and then I could look to take the long entry. Because as you can see here, if you get caught on the wrong side of this thing, if you buy near a high, this thing could grind on you for a month, two months, before it actually puts in a trend side movement. That's even in the best case scenario of the trend staying alive. So entry here, really important. Uh, Hans says, not chasing gold equals not go short gold. Uh, I wouldn't go short here, and, and this one's just my personal flavor, and it's because I think there's better dollar trends out there right now. Um, you know, myself, I like that dollar yen move. I can understand a lot of folks that don't, like uh, Boutros, for instance. I mean, I can't get the guy to look at a dollar yen chart to save my life. He hates it. He's got a couple of uh, colloquial things for it that I can't really repeat here. Um, but that's that's my idea for a long dollar position. And, and the, again, big reason there is the potential for policy divergence. Uh, between the BOJ and the Fed. 
you know, in the effort of long dollar, um, a few and maybe a little more attractive. I mean, so you know, let's also kind of kind of mash this up with the the macro overlay that would be that would be persists, persistent at the time. If we're getting a strong dollar, if we are getting um, you know, higher rate expectations. If we are getting hawkish out of the Fed, uh, if if you know, if we're getting this kind of you know, a compendium of of of, of inputs, then I think some of the more attractive areas to look for that rate differential getting priced in, maybe on some of these higher rate currencies. It's just a theory at this point. I still need to validate this price action. And I'm not going to chase this theme if if uh, if price action doesn't show me that it may have some follow through. But here, let me show you what I'm referring to here. Um, so the Australian dollar, you know, if we go back to that 2011 top that we had in gold, I know a lot of folks want to overlay these and say, oh, there's a correlation there. Australia makes a lot of gold. Miners in Australia are like 8% of the economy. It's a small, small portion of what Australia is. The uh, correlation plays when it plays. Um, at least in my opinion, more more because of this and metals, this and commodities, more of a commodity play. But I wouldn't overlay it to gold directly. I wouldn't overlay it to ore directly. I wouldn't overlay it to copper directly. It's it's kind of an amalgamation of those metals markets, in my opinion. But what is the market that got, that got hit the most throughout that four to five year period of dollar strength? where markets were beginning to price in the eventual into QE, the eventual anticipation of normalization. Um, to my eyes, one of those markets that got hit the most is here in the Australian dollar. You know, and you can see that big downside run that we've had since 2011. And this, again, is just basically, a, um, I'm not even going to say an interest rate differential play. It's a interest rate delta differential play, uh, expectation for interest rate changes, right? Because Throughout this duration, Australia is looking at cuts, looking more dovish, looking at cuts, looking more dovish. The Fed's flat, saying eventually we're going to hike rates. Not now, but eventually. And then you know we get to 2015, they back off, and then that's when the Aussie starts to get to topside moves. Let's go down a little bit tighter. Okay, so again, uh, that month of May is when that that uh, that USD street really began to show again, right? Very similar to what we had last year, and and again. The Aussie was just sucker punched when we were seeing that theme get priced in. So an easier way of saying what I'm trying to show is when we have seen these instances of dollar strength over the last, say, 16 months, 18 months, one of the currencies that has appeared to be the weakest when matched up with that dollar has been here in the Aussie. So you know this could be another uh, another way to look to capitalize on that dollar strength should, or or I guess away from the Japanese yen, uh, looking at short Aussie dollar. Uh, and you can see this thing has been trying to, or it looks like it's been trying to top out for a little while. We got a little bit of support, which to me just seems like it's a little bit of tightening up. Um, you know, to get a little more near to this Jackson Hole summit. But uh, in the event of dollar strength, this is another one that I'm looking at for the prospect of continuation. Again, it's not showing me a bearish price action scenario yet. We have what could be a channel break or resistance check of a prior trend line, but I'm not going to get too bought in behind that on a short-term observation, trying to peg a longer-term theme. And a one level to be watching here, we've got the, the big figure down here at 75. Notice there's a couple of fibs that have caught quite a bit of price action between those two. But you know, if, if one wanted to take a super conservative stance towards something like this, when and when trading a reversal, I think that's you know a very very prudent thing to be doing. Um, you can set this big figure in the line and say I'm going to use this as a litmus. I'm not even going to investigate a short position until sellers are able to break through this. And then if they are able to break it through, you know then it becomes infinitely more well not infinitely it becomes quite a bit more interesting um, because now we have lower lows, lower highs, and then I can simply look to sell the next lower high. Uh, so resistance looking to take it deeper, and then I got couple of longer term target levels down here in the 72 range. Another big confluent level. One other market that I'm looking at in the event of dollar strength is uh, Swissy. And this is still the same kind of setup that I had last week. Um, or Tuesday, excuse me. And you know we have what could be another higher low right in here above the Brexit low. 
above that May 2nd low, May 2nd, May 3rd. Okay, so we could have the makings of longer term higher lows coming in here. That said, shorter term, we do have some lower highs. Just broke above that one, so that's why I'm beginning to get a little bit more bullish. Big long-term level here, 96.81, so a very rational reason for resistance to be coming in uh, at the moment. This 96.81 level and this whole Fibonacci retracement has been uh, a pretty good little, pretty good little thing for me. So if you want to draw that one up, it's uh, simply taking the high back here in 2008 to the 2011 low on dollar Swiss. And notice how beautifully that December high in 2015 was caught by the 618. It's the 50 that's at 96.81. That's uh, giving us current resistance right now. Good example of a long-term FIB just continuing to come in, show support, show resistance, very utilitarian type of thing. Once I get down to the hourly chart, you can begin to get the, the, the gist of this move higher. Uh, I wasn't bought on the reversal here because we failed to make a higher, uh, failed to make a higher high. We had this spike set a high right here. We weren't able to break that high, but when we broke that yesterday, that's when I was beginning to get a little more interested in it. Running to 96.81, like I said, very rational reason for sellers to respond. Comes in, gives us the higher low right in here, and now we've just burst up to a new higher high. Now, like I mentioned, this is one of my favorite dollar strength candidates going into tomorrow. And there's a couple of different ways that I could play this. Now that I have a, a, what looks to be a fresh uptrend confirmed. I have a swing level that I could look at for a stop. If I get a little bit of improvement in price between now and say like 9 a.m. tomorrow, uh, we're about 40 pips off this level, so I don't want to chase it from here. I don't want to have to pay the extra 40 and, and, uh, and like have to or what can get away with. But if price is going to shed, if price is going to drop, between now and 9 a.m., then I could begin to get a little more interested in it, looking to load up on a long dollar setup uh, ahead of Jackson Hole or ahead of Miss, Miss, Miss Yellen's speech. And I look at a stop like right here. Being a little bit more conservative, I could take this prior swing low down here at about 96 and a quarter. I could look to get the stop at about 96.20. In that case, maybe I'd be in, end up taking you know, 35, 40 ish pips of risk. The, the key variant for me is I want to be able to get a one to one to that 96.81 level. Because it's coming as resistance multiple times, maybe we get a break, but you know the fear that I have is that we move up, reverse, and then I'm still forced to take a stop. So I want to set this up so that I have a one-one up to this 96.81 level. So my kind of target ideal would be entry 96.40-ish. Then when this moves up, stop to break even, let the scale out a piece of the lot. If I can get a continued run higher, fantastic. If not. Take the rest out of the stop, but again, the variable would essentially be looking to play a shift in, in, in expectations for Fed policy in the near term, as traders begin to price in that slightly higher probability that the Fed may actually do something. You know, again, similar to what I, what we saw in May. I want to see a similar recurrence to that, and I know this is Swissy, but you know, you look at the move that it put in in May. You had this low at 94.42, again running right up to a longer term Fed level here. And ran all the way up to another longer term FIB level at 99.48. Just looking at this one, you could probably deduce as to why it is that I'm watching the Swissy. These longer term FIB values have continued to provide support, resistance levels, uh, inflection points, jump points, all kinds of interesting stuff has been taking place at these FIBs. So when I get something that's working cleanly with my analytical, um, say, backdrop, and that's what I want to focus on a little bit more, and that's been the Swissy of late. But that, my friends, is what I have for today. Uh, see that we have quite a few questions. Feel free to fire anything at me that you might want to. Let's see, we've got a good one from Sharif here. I'm going to save that one because I think I might be able to sink my teeth into it. Uh, Deshaun Goodwin, how can I listen to her? Um, good question. Now, I believe that one of the major cable providers or one of the major cable channels, um, at least one, is going to be there. I, I think CNBC will. Um, I'm guessing that maybe Bloomberg as well. And if that's the case, you should be able to watch it completely free online because Bloomberg has their television channel uh, going through their website, like right here. It's like the live audio or the uh, live TV. So I think... I think you'll be able to watch it on here, but I'm, I can't confirm. I don't. Uh, yeah, sure. It says Bloomberg Radio as well. Beautiful. Sure, it's always on the spot. 
man knows his stuff. Um, from Gene DeFau, if Yellen is dovish, do you have a target on dollar yen? Well, I'm long, so uh, that would be my stop. Um, for downside plays, I do not. And the reason is because we haven't been down in this region for a long time. I mean, the one obvious level would be the Briggs low. I mean, I think this is like, I think this is like 98.78. Get that exact level. Uh, 98 and three quarters, give or take, 98.777. Um, yeah, I got a fib here, 98.32. Maybe something there. But, you know, other than those two, well, that one. Primarily, it's kind of a no man's land until we get down to some of these psych levels of like 97.50, Um If this thing breaks against me, basically, I'm going to eat my stop and wait and reassess. I'll see if I get a deeper support level at like a 92 or something. 92.50 could be good if it continues flying. Um, but, you know, whenever it's counter to my position, the, the way that I'll look at it essentially is if my stop gets taken out, I don't really care where it's going to stop or where it's going to stop dropping. Um, it's my job at that point to react and reassess. I guess the bigger question that I'd have is if we do see that drop, if we do see the dollar selling off on the back of dovish comments from Yellen, um, how else does that shift the paradigm, right? You know, we looked at long gold a minute ago. If, if Yellen does dove this up and basically says, listen, we've been doing this cat and mouse game for seven years now and it hasn't worked. So as opposed to telling you what we're going to try to do at the meeting a year from now, we're going to play it by ear. And we're going to raise rates when the economy needs it. And we're going to support growth when the economy needs it. If she says something like that, then I think the dollar could take a bath. And then we could see that thing fly lower. Um, but on that same regards, I think that gold setup that I'm looking at is going to scream higher. And I mean, we could end up seeing, and I don't want to be too abulian here, but <clears throat> again, this isn't a, you know, an extreme dove scenario. I think we see 1400 on gold in very short order. You know, like I was saying, that thing, it puts in these violent trend side moves, and we do get one of those drivers coming out in markets. And uh, if, if that was the scenario that takes place, then then the metals are where I'd want to be watching. And uh, on the flip of that, you know, also something like, you know, long Aussie, right? Because we'd be seeing declining U.S. rate expectations, which amount to dollar weakness. I think that dollar weakness would be... Um, the degree of that dollar weakness would be what it's matched up with, given the, the interest rate of the uh, of the counter currency of the pair, or base currency of the pair, given the USD's counter. Uh, from Sue, what made the DAX to go into a long-term uptrend, yet it has started a downtrend from April last year. Uh, so there's a couple of things that really fired on that DAX uptrend this year, um, most of which are central bank related. So we had a, a, a gigantic, uh, I mean, a mother load of a, of a stimulus program launched by the ECB in March. So February, we had kind of simultaneous lows coming in. Um, Across equity, across equity indices after Ms. Yellen's uh, Humphrey Hawkins testimony in front of Congress. So you'll see this a very similar low showing up in like say like the S&P, NASDAQ, CAC 40, etc. Um, but it was March, April when this thing really began to move, began breaking above some of these prior swing highs uh, on the back of the ECB bond buying program. And you know a lot of folks <laughs> probably wouldn't have expected this, but the next big uh, the next big extension in that trend was, was post-Brexit. Brexit happened. There's a lot of risk, a lot of fear. And all of a sudden, everybody said, oh, hey, central banks got this. They're not going to let the whole thing fly away. Buy stocks. Because central banks are not until they have to. Um, so in my opinion, the most recent extension that we've had in the uptrend has been that. Now, as to whether or not it's in a downtrend or an uptrend, bigger picture, it's going to be a very relative thing. Like, for instance, just looking at this on the daily, and I could show this to you on the weekly as well. You look at this on the weekly, that near-term move does seem lower. You know, this is still a lower high, below the swing high that we had back in uh, November 2015. Just set a lower low in February. So a statement can be made that on this weekly chart, this thing is still developing. Monthly, looks like a blip in the radar. 
right? So, I mean, trend diagnostics, a very relative type of thing. I think an easier way of, of kind of looking at this, especially when doing macro analysis, is just a super simple um, delineator like 200-day uh, moving average. I know it's very generalized. It's not super attractive. It doesn't have any, you know, <laughs> it doesn't have any kind of like magical quality behind it or anything like that. But for for reading trends, something like this could be pretty valuable in my opinion. So I'm just going to put on the 200-day DMA. You can even see where it'll catch some resistance, some support, some support, support, support. And I mean, when we had this real strong uptrend, it was just running along the 200 DMA. You know, so you could use something like that to make it a little more apples to apples to try to remove a little bit of that subjectivity that uh, often comes about with relative trend diagnostics. You know, because to me, it might look like an uptrend, whereas to you it looks like a downtrend, and there's not really a way of reconciling that unless we use a, um, you know, somewhat of a commoditized input value, like a 200 DMA. Awesome question from Shrif here. Getting my breath for this one. It's going to be a long, <laughs> long explanation. Uh, could you expand on what helicopter money means? I hear the phrase a lot, but don't fully understand what it means. It doesn't really have a direct textbook definition yet. Helicopter money is very theoretical in nature. It was initially floated as an idea from Milton Friedman in his book. I might not remember the full details. I believe the book was Quantum of Money from 1964, maybe it was 67. Please don't quote me on the dates, but it was uh, Milton Friedman's idea in the book, uh, quant, uh, it was Quantum Effect of Money, something like that. Mr. Friedman said, he posited, he said, okay, if you take $1,000, and you go up in a helicopter and you just drop it out and the people on the ground didn't think that there would be another one as in if you just throw a fresh thousand dollars on the ground then people would go and pick it up and then people would go and use it and then as they use it that spurns inflation so this was basically an offshoot idea of Milton Friedman 1960s saying if you give people free money they're gonna use it provided that you don't debase the currency enough to where they lose faith in it, which is the key. That is the key. So now it comes down to execution. The general concept is pretty clear. Helicopter money is the idea of flushing the economy with money, giving money to real people so they can then go and spend it to then, in turn, bring on inflation. Where this topic gets really muddy is a, is a subshoot in economic theory called universal basic income which is the idea of giving everybody in a populace a check for doing nothing. I know that sounds insane, but that's actually an idea that has been discussed by actual economists. Um, the idea being, if we give everybody universal basic income, A, it takes care of many welfare purposes, so kind of one fell shoot, fixes a fiscal problem, but it also gives them capital to go and spend, and then that spending drives inflation. That inflation leads to growth. And then before you know it, you have that beautiful symbiotic growth scenario where inflation is coming about, interest rates are going up, growth is continuing, everybody's happy, right? In practice, and I think that this is something that the negative rate argument had missed as well, in practice, people's opinion change when the underpinnings of an economy change. As in, if you found a helicopter dropping a thousand dollars of money out of thin air, would you really think that it would be the only drop? Or would you go looking for more? Rational human self-interest dictates that most human beings will go looking for more. You found free money? Get more. As opposed to just being happy with the two $1 bills you picked up off the ground to go and spin them on a pack of gum. So, I mean, at this point, we're dabbling in, you know, extremely deep theory uh, and, 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 and very untested theoretical concepts. That's the basis of helicopter money. Now, on the execution part of it, um, how does a government begin to give people money? Well, you got to first create the money, right? That's where QE comes in. QE creates the money. And that's kind of the sticking point right now on helicopter money in Japan is technically it's not legal. Because Japan is not legally allowed, as of right now, to underwrite their own government debt. That was one of the things that had brought such a strong pop into the dollar yen after those elections in July. If you guys remember, uh, Shinzo Abe's conservative party won a supermajority in the upper house of parliament. This weekend, right after this, uh, the weekend that took place between this bar and this bar, right here. 
Now, as he won that, or as his coalition won that supermajority, it basically said, well, listen, Shinzo Abe now has the power within his coalition to change the constitution of Japan. That's what made the prospect of helicopter money a lot more real. Because now the, the, the prospect of resistance within the Japanese diet, their version of Congress, diminished mightily. And so that's why we saw the, the, the initial pricing in of, of something more from BOJ. Because it was like, well, hey, now Abi doesn't have resistance within, within, uh, within the upper house of parliament. Now, just because they didn't come to the table in July doesn't mean they're not going to come to the table again at least in my opinion. And it kind of goes back to that example that I was uh, using a moment ago. If, if, if you're between a rock and a hard place and you just have one shot, are you going to fire it too quickly? So, I mean, the Bank of Japan just saw what happens when you fire something off pretty quickly without examining it too deeply. So are we going to see helicopter money in September? I don't know. But that's not their only option. You know, that's just an example of one of the extreme options they can embark upon in the effort of, of, of continuing to ramp up stimulus, even if they're, you know, buying up a bigger and bigger share of the JGB market. Uh, sure, if asking, do you still watch SSI? Yeah, definitely. Um, I've always used SSI as just another data point. You know, it helps me with, you know, seeing... I guess you could say veracity of trends, but it's uh, not really anything that's a timing indicator or anything like that for me. Uh, ooh, good question here. Um, Andy Pedraza, uh, with the Swiss pension for taking unilateral actions, such as when they unpick the Swiss from the euro, how comfortable are you trading it? I mean, if it's not around a plan S and B event, I'm okay with it. it. It doesn't have the death knell for me. Euro Swiss is going to be a little different, because Euro Swiss is what the Swiss National Bank actually manages to. Um, you know, for Switzerland, it's not an easy prospect, right? They're landlocked, they're surrounded by another currency, and they're essentially in a position where they have to trade um, with folks using the euro, and they don't really have many options about it. Now, that said, I do think that the Swiss National Bank's in a unique position in the regards that they might be able to go deeper and deeper and deeper into negative rates. But with that said, I also am not expecting any, uh, oh, I just can't really expect tail risk, but uh, I'm not really expecting any black swan events in, in, unless we get, you know, extremely strong Swiss franc. Now, just hearkening back to uh, Brexit, the, the rumor, and I believe this was even confirmed by Mr. Jordan himself, the rumor was that the S&P did jump in to weaken the franc, right? They saw the success of franc strength on the back of the Brexit referendum as the euro. Uh, sorry, that's the wrong one. This one right here. That's when they jumped in. That was a different scenario. We'll talk about that later. Um, right here, Brexit. Notice the Swiss franc driving stronger against the euro. Then right here, it puts in a vigorous bounce. Like if we look at this on like an hourly chart, it's going to look just basically parabolic. There we go. Oh, that's the one basically parabolic. You can see this thing dump as the uh, Swiss franc strengthens against the euro, and then it just V-shapes, right? Now, the accusation was that this was the Swiss National Bank jumping in to sell franc to weaken their exchange rate and the effort of keeping this thing from strengthening up too greatly. Now, if you look at the side that I was lining that trade up on, it's the same side. So, in essence here, looking to get on the same direction of what the Swiss National Bank wants. So I don't see this as being adversarial to what a central bank is looking to do. I look at this as aligning myself with what both central banks are apparently trying to guide their currency or the same direction that both of these central banks appear to be guiding their currency. Swiss franc or SMB wants a cheaper franc, a weaker franc. The US dollar or the Federal Reserve appears to be getting a little bit more hawkish. So to me that interest rate differential it plays a little bit more. Um, and that's why I'm a little more, I guess, comfortable playing technical scenarios in, in something like dollar Swiss than I'd be against like a direct Euro Swiss. Euro Swiss has the S&P's attention. I'm not sure how much attention the dollar Swiss has. Uh, 
Uh, another good one here. Uh, Shrift says, if she goes dovish, watch the S&P 500. Yeah, another good take. And I think that this is just another reason we might see a little bit of hawkishness come in here. I mean, I think you can see traders trying to price that in right now as the S&P setting near uh, these, these swing lows, near session lows as well. Um, but if she does go full dove, then yeah, I think this thing's going to take off and go vertical. But I think it's just another reason why she might want to try to, you know, kind of hedge that 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 extreme optimism, that extreme risk uh, accumulation that we've seen drive these things to all time fresh, even fresher, all time highs. Uh, Sue says, but the market doesn't move by news, but by supply and demand. But if the news is big enough, it has like an impact supply and demand, right? That's the beauty of supply and demand. That's the beauty of what's called rational self-interest. And I think that's something that a lot of folks are missing today. Uh, and I'm sorry, Sue, I did not mean to frame that towards yourself. I just mean generally speaking. Um, the invisible hand, you know, Adam Smith's idea, which is key to the concept of capitalism, the invisible hand is driven by rational self-interest. That's what make cap makes capitalism work, that people are actively acting in their own greedy self-interest. On a micro scale, it's an ugly thing. On a macro scale, it works, or it has, at least for the last couple hundred years. Um, but within that rationality is that investors don't want to lose money if they can do anything about it, right? So let's say that tomorrow Yellen comes out and says, guys, I, you know, I, I know that stocks are at all-time highs. I know rates have been really low, but you know what? We've got a bigger problem in this economy to find benefit plans because we have a record number of people hitting retirement every single year and that's only going to continue for the next 20 years and those folks need income and with rates so low many of those pension funds are looking very precarious what we're going to do is we're going to post 200 basis points of hikes over the next two months and there's nothing you can do about it let's just say that that's not, I'm not expecting that to happen let's just say that it did if that happens I expect the S&P would take a bath because now markets need to factor in a significantly more tight, significantly tighter monetary environment for the coming months. Now, would that news have effect on supply and demand, do you think? I do. I think that that news would kill demand for long S&P. I think it would, it would it massively increase supply, especially at current levels. You have a ton of traders that want to sell while you're still up here, and then you'd see price dropping, dropping, dropping until eventually somebody said, you know what? That's a good value. Even with 200 basis points of hikes coming in the next two months, I don't think it'd be a 2100, but hypothetically speaking, at some point that would probably come about. But news absolutely drives supply and demand. The big question is how, right? And the relative grading of that. And that is exactly what it is that we do as traders. Try to figure out probabilities of set events happening, how much that might get priced in. But at the end of the day, we have to know full well, full well, that this tick, whatever's going to price tomorrow, is unknown. I don't know what's going to happen on the next hour, the next day, the next minute. Nobody does. The most that we have is seeing the picture of today as clearly as possible and the effort of getting the best idea of what to do so that we might be able to get a 51% probability in our favor. 52%. Maybe a 55% if we're really, really, really good. So that's what I look to do. And that's why I look at things like news. That's why I look at text, because I'm of the opinion that all of these little things can offer me a little bit of benefit with none being a panacea, none being an end-all, be-all, and no holy grails exist. At the end of the day, it's me that makes this stuff work because I'm the one that's executing it. I'm the one that's setting my limits. I'm the one setting my limits. I'm the one choosing which markets I'm going to hit. And it's me. That's my opinion on it. And that's why I think confidence, psychology, that's why I think these things are so utterly important to a trader. Because at the end of the day, outside of your analytical skill set, that's really all that you have. And your analytical skill set isn't going to work every time. Right? That's just uh, my take on matters. Uh, Jamie Colazzo, good question here. Arrival late. Have you spoken about the pound dollar? I have not. <laughs> I'm going to be uh, real honest with you. I avoided that one for a reason. Um, the reason is because uh, right now um, BOE is also a little bit messy to me. Um, 
so I know that expectations on BOE are like extreme dove right now. Um, I'm of the opinion that that's a little bit of the uh, tail of the dog, if you will. What I mean by that is much of this movement of Sterling has been driven by commentary from Carney, right? Carney saying, well, Brexit happened. And here, this is a, to me a good tell. So this is Brexit. Right, we get this quick wick. We actually saw prices running higher, and it wasn't until Carney jumped in and said, "You know what? Brexit's bad. I'm cutting rates." And then we saw that big break on 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 on, uh, on the strong. That's when we finally got the 130 break, and prices come back. And then Carney starts talking again. You know what? We're gonna do something big. I mean, he did do something big. They launched a veritable bazooka. They started buying corporate bonds, and this is the you know, this is a big one. So the corporate bond market in the UK is $150 billion. The BOE is going to buy $10 billion. I know that only sounds like 6%, 7%, but if you, you, you run the numbers, if that brings a 7% increase in prices, if you're already long, that's great. But to those that do buy British corporate bonds in the next couple of years, that's going to be a challenge. So now you're buying them at these atmospheric levels. So even with that bazooka that was launched, right here, the sterling's coming right back to where it was, right? This thing isn't continuing to drive lower. Now, the reason that I think that this thing, um, well, A, has driven higher, and then B, could have the potential to drive higher is because what's the after effect of a 10% move, 15% move in a currency? especially for a import heavy economy because while that British pound is getting weaker and weaker and weaker the US dollars still relatively strong especially when compared to the sterling especially when compared to this chart import prices right inflationary pressure starts to starts to tickle in that may prevent the BOE from doing another rate cut so again, just trying to see around the next corner and see what the next theme might be. Um, I'm beginning to look for a shift in BOE policy in the next couple of months unless something new happens, something big changes. But I do think that inflation is going to be going to be something the BOE is going to have to contend with in the coming months. Um, now with that said, with so much messiness in the U.S. dollar, I don't want to marry up something that I already kind of see is very messy <laughs> with another very messy uh, scenario. Right now both sides of this are kind of a question mark for me, so I don't want to do anything too... too uh, uh, too aggressive on, on either side of it. All right, I got to hustle. We got uh, time, but I see a couple of really good questions, including one from a friend I haven't seen in a while. I don't want to make sure that I take. Um, Joe Long with a question here. If Yellen is hawkish, what do you see the S&P drop into? Depends on how hawkish he gets. Like, I, you know, even in, you know, I, let's say the upper bound of my expectations tomorrow, it's not going to be too much because I think that she's, She's got a vested interest in in in, uh, in relative calm, right? The last thing she wants to do on a summer weekend is you know trigger panic fire sales. I don't think she's going to come out and be too telling with anything. If if she, if she's able to toe that hawkish line, which again is what my expectation is, and she's going to say something in Fed speak that's going to be like only oh, economic risk to the outlook have diminished further, and we're nearing targets, you know all this other stuff. That, that that's kind of how I do it. Um, you know, that 2137 level looks pretty good to me. Uh, it's not here. It's this one right over here. You know, that to me was a significant swing high that hasn't really caught a test yet. So, you know, if I was going to look for a slightly deeper support level that wasn't a full-on reversal, what I would probably want to do is take this high right here, go over and fast forward to that pre-Brexit high, Right there, it gives me a little range, like 21.25 up to say like 21.40, and then I could look for support within there. I think something like that could be a, a level to watch for support. Now, you know, kind of like I was, I was, I was looking to do with gold. If gold does not set that support at 12.85, I am not going to chase it because if this thing is continuing to cut, then I expect that it's going to go quite a bit deeper. And if it doesn't support here, that's fine. I'll simply look to catch it to support at like a 2100, a 2050, 2040, something like that. It's one of those markets that I don't want to take on a deep reversal strategy unless I'm, I'm pretty sure about support being confirmed there.
um, from Dilip. How about Dollar Cat? How about Dollar Cat? I'm sorry, I don't have anything in Dollar Cat right now. Um, nothing I'm really looking to act on. Again, it's, it's kind of messy for me. Maybe a Dollar Weakness candidate, but not necessarily one that I'd want to strike on right now. But if we do get a continuation of Dollar Weakness, there's these deeper levels right in here. I mean, before I'm going to get you know, too bought into any extended downturn, I want to see those taken out first. I've seen a, a lot of price actually take place around there. Little zone right in here. Big swing down in here. Thwart of that downtrend. To me, this one's kind of no man's land, but... Uh, you know, if I can get some downward price movement, then that's something that could, you know, change my view and and and, and something that, that could uh, get on with in the near future. But for right now, I'm sorry, I just don't have anything uh, anything I feel too good about. And now here's my friend. I haven't seen him in a long time. Fati, Fati Tavoli. He's been uh, with me since pretty much day one. Been been talking with Fati now for about six years, seven years almost. Well, it's really good to see you in the room, my friend. I hope that all is well. Um, Fati asks, uh, can you please summarize what instruments you have shortlisted for USD strength and USD weakness? Thanks. I'm trying to use tomorrow as a macro positioning in play. And that's basically it. There's a couple of, I guess, contextual points that have played into that. One is uh, volatility of late has been, been pretty lackluster. Um, you know, I don't want to try to push a square peg through a round hole by looking for, you know, massive momentum tomorrow. Maybe it doesn't come about. I mean, I think there's a good chance that Yellen just tries not to say anything too telling and, you know, tries to go and enjoy her weekends with her friends there in Wyoming. Um, I think there's a good chance something like that happening. So, again, I'm not going to try to press it too hard here. Uh, instead, I want to try to, you know, look at this as beneficially as I can. Um, you know, now on the dollar strength side, I'm looking at uh, dollar yen still hanging out here at that 100 support level. Um, and then on the other side, gold is somewhat of the object of my desire right now. If we get dollar strength, I want to try to find a deeper support entry here for a longer term type of play. Kind of get the gist of that setup right here. Looks like I have a formation of a new bullish uptrend. I want to try to buy some higher low support. We haven't really seen much of the support test here at this 1285 zone, so I'm uh, kind of stalking that one for right now. Um, if we end up with straight up weakness, that's cool too. I could work with that. Uh, I've got a couple of different levels here to to wait for those entries. 1357 break could lead to a 1357 support entry. Uh, 1342 could be a good level two, you know, to use that as kind of like a litmus, let it break, and then look to buy that higher low. I could even use a level uh, just a little bit north of current price, about 1329. But this is my favorite dollar weakness component. Now, my expectation for tomorrow is that uh, we're going to, again, this is my guess, I guess is a better way of putting it, is that we're going to see um, a slight amount of hawkishness from Miss Yellen. I mean, just the pattern from what we've seen off these Fed officials over the last week has kind of appeared to, it's appeared to me to be a concerted push. But uh, I think that, and again, my opinion is we're going to see Yellen give a little bit of hawkishness. That is what I'm hoping will give me a deeper support entry here on gold, and then we'll we'll prop up that dollar yen setup. Um, you know, hopefully long enough for some from BOJ to start talking. Prospects of, of uh, trading in central bank-driven markets, my friends. It's uh, you're essentially waiting on one or two people to talk, you know. And I know it might be hard to believe, but I remember a time in markets where it wasn't all lined up around one or two people. And uh, as I learned it, that's that's the norm, the rule, and not the exception. Um, okay, so last question of the day, and this is a good one. It's a deep inner game question, a random question. Just picking your brain, trading journals. You mentioned before that you keep one. What kind of info do you log? What kind of info have you found useful to keep track of review? I can do a couple of different things. I do logs and then I do a journal. Uh, the log is just a spreadsheet that records everything that I do in all markets. So that way I can, I could uh, apples to apples what I'm doing, you know, various asset classes like options and equities versus what I'm doing in like an FX or, or futures or whatever. Um, so that's just pure data. The journal itself is uh, real simple. It's just a Moleskin uh, journal. Moleskin is a company. It's not using, you know, hides or 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 uh, any animal-based products. I have to mention that because I actually had a, a gentleman a few years back said I use a Moleskin journal. He's like, "What do you think about all those poor moles who have their skins taken from them?" I assure you, the moles are left okay. Moleskin is just a brand name, <laughs> um, but. Uh, I use one of those, and at the end of every day, I just write down what I did, how I felt, 
throughout the day, if I see something interesting, I'll jot it down. Nothing scientific. The key is just doing it every single day. Um, for me, I use a few, uh, one of those pins that has like four different colors in it. So I have like a different color coding system for the type of comment that I'm trying to write for myself. Um, the best, one of the better pieces of advice I ever got in my career um, it was like my second day on the desk at Merrill. Uh, one of the few older guys <laughs> actually uh, was willing to impart advice came over to me and said, do not wake up in a new world every morning. And that was a very, um, you know, kind of eye-opening comment for me. What he said is, you know, I'm going to work my tail off today, and I don't want to have to start all over from scratch tomorrow. I mean, I don't want to wake up and have to think of who I need to call or think of what I need to do, think of what markets I need to analyze, think of what markets I need to look at. I need to be able to pick up from yesterday and continue. That presents power because that's savings of time, right? So that journal, that's what it allows me to do. It allows me to get into my head as to what I was thinking yesterday or what happened yesterday or what I was looking at yesterday or you know, any of that stuff. And it allows me to pick it up and take on a new day. It allows me to not wake up in a brand new world every single morning. And uh, you know, for me, that's, that's very helpful. I've been doing that now for uh, almost 16 years. And <laughs> I mean, the cool part to me, and I don't get too deep on this on a webinar, but the cool part to me is how you can kind of chart your own personal growth, right? If I look at those trading journals that I did five years ago or 10 years ago, or even a year ago, I could see where I've improved. I could see where I've grown. And that itself is motivating. When you hit a drawdown, when you get a period, like we have right now, when things are real quiet, not a lot to do, review those old journals. They'll fire you up because you did it. And that's your record of it. Otherwise, it's just going to be lost to the, lost to the history. Um, but that, my friends, is what I have for today. Uh, I want to say thank you very, very much, everybody, for joining me. Really, really appreciate your time. Uh, I will have this archive uploaded onto YouTube just about an hour-ish from now. But uh, we'll be back on the air next week, Tuesday at 1, Thursday at 2. Hope to see each and every one of you, ladies and gentlemen, uh, back in the show. But thank you so much for your time. Have a fantastic rest of the day. And as always, happy trading, ladies and gentlemen.